Welcome to Razorback Reels. I'm Drew Chamberlain. And I'm Ani Olivas. Thank you for joining us. As always, this week has been packed with pop culture and we have a lot to cover. To kick off this fun-filled episode of Reels, Ani and I have some real talk where we can get into all the latest in Hollywood this week. Starting on a more somber note, O.J. Simpson passed away last week and his death is causing nationwide discussion about his life and legacy. Ani, how did you find out? To be honest, I actually found out from someone that I haven't talked to in a really long time. They just reached out. For some reason, they heard that O.J. Simpson died and said, Ani needs to know this and they need to hear from me. Um, so it was really kind of a shock because I thought it was a joke at first. At point, I found out in journalism class and so that was a pretty <laughs> interesting way to find out. O.J. Simpson's trial was a historic moment in television, but another monumental TV staple is getting attention this week. The Golden Bachelor, a spinoff of the iconic dating show, has been making headlines after their winning couple just announced their divorce only three months after getting hitched. Drew, do you think this marriage was doomed from the start? I mean, starting dating that late, I mean, it's so tough, and especially when you add reality TV into the mix and... Uh, mm -hmm. The promise of everlasting love at that age. I don't know. It could be yeah. tough. It doesn't surprise me. You mm -hmm. know, television, it's always a little bit too good to be true. Yeah. Do I think it could have worked maybe if they weren't the center of a television show? Mm -hmm. Maybe, but we'll never know. Yeah, that always brings a lot more drama than is necessary. And, you know, young love, you know how it goes. So. Except for old love, yeah. That we, <laughs> you couldn't have expected these two, but... <laughs> Uh, even though The Golden Bachelor broke our hearts, Saturday Night Live got us laughing with a packed show this weekend. This week's host, Ryan Gosling, stole the show with some hilarious sketches, a Taylor Swift parody, and a breakup with his Ken character. Ani, what was your favorite moment from the show? I mean, obviously, the All Too Well cover. Um, obviously, I love any chance to bring up Taylor Swift. Um, but you were saying something earlier about the Beavis and Butthead sketch. Yes, there uh, was a sketch where... Uh, Ryan Gosling plays Beavis from Beavis and Butthead, <laughs> and he's distracting um, the focus of a lecture that is going on. And the sketch in itself is is written just okay, but it's the it's the breaking from Gosling and his co-stars Ooh, and the burn. consistent laughing that just makes it so mm -hmm. so enjoyable to watch. He's definitely one of my favorite guest hosts. Yeah, exactly. I always like whenever I can see that the cast actually has fun when they're doing their actual job. For our next segment of the night, we have winners and losers. Our NCU reporters will be breaking down who's on top and who's in their flop era each week. Razorback Reels reporter Maddie Phipps is here with the weekly breakdown. That's right, I'll be crowning our kings and queens of the entertainment industry and throwing tomatoes at those who have fallen for, from grace. But I'm feeling nice today, so let's start with a winner. My first winner of the week is the Midwest Princess Chapel Rowan. If you don't know who I'm talking about, I promise you will soon. Chapel is finally getting her time in the spotlight after her debut album was released in September. Rowan served as the opener for Olivia Rodrigo on the first leg of the Guts Tour, introducing a new generation to this phenomenon. She recently secured her first top 100 spot with her latest single, Good Luck Babe. Rowan also debuted at Coachella over the weekend, quickly becoming one of the most talked about performers of the festival. Well, at least on my feed, she was. She's also a loud and proud queer artist making ways in the industry like the greats of Lady Gaga and Prince who came before her. She's a winner in my book, and when she takes over the music industry, just remember, you're standing face to face with I told you so. Now from one gay icon to, well, Jojo Siwa, while the former dance mom star turned child pop star is out and proud, I would argue she's not making headlines for anything worth praise. Jojo is currently in hot water for kind of everything the celeb has done during this rebrand. Siwa recently adorned a bad girl persona, coupled with kiss-like makeup and a really, really bad song. And speaking of that song, not one, but two controversies have come out of the track. First, Siwa's lead single is not an original. The track was originally written in 2011 for Miley Cyrus, but was passed on to British singer Brit Smith. Smith's version leaked online, and it is leagues better than Siwa's. So not really controversial, but definitely embarrassing. The other controversy of Karma is the music video. Yeah, that one choreography move is just ridiculous. It has quickly become a meme, and this whole rebrand has as well. Jojo, you are a loser. A very entertaining one, but a loser nonetheless. Moving back to our winners, this time a duo is securing the spot. Rachel Zegler and Kit Connor will make their Broadway de debuts as the famous star-crossed lovers Romeo and Juliet. 
The Heartstopper actor and West Side Story actress will star in a brand new musical with music by Jack Antonoff this fall. Has Romeo and Juliet been done a million times before? Yes. Is there literally another high profile production of the Shakespearean tragedy set to open in London next month? Also yes. Do I still eat it up every time? Absolutely. I can never get enough of this love story. Whether it's plastic garden gnomes or a zombie apocalypse, it's truly one of the best tragedies of all time. I can't wait to see what Rachel and Kit bring to the iconic couple. And if anyone wants to buy me a ticket, I'll die for you. Get it? And finally, our last loser. Now, full disclosure, you know how some people have that one celebrity that they just hate? Yeah, this week's loser is mine. Let me just have this one free pass before I graduate to be entirely biased. I've been waiting for this man's fall from grace and maybe my wish has been granted. <sighs> Infamous country singer Morgan Wallen was arrested on three felony accounts in Nashville early last week. The 30-year-old musician allegedly threw a chair from a rooftop bar, resulting in his arrest. Wallen is scheduled to appear in court early next month. I have to mention, this is also not Wallen's first run-in with the law. In 2020, he was arrested for public intoxication, and he was also suspended from his label in 2021 for shouting a racial slur. But of course, he is a man in country music, so his fall from grace has been slow and in many ways non-existent. Now, I do have a d deeper bias against this man, but there's no denying that throwing a chair off a rooftop and endangering civilians makes you a loser in all contexts. Well, those are my picks for the winners and losers of this week. Do you think I got them right, or did I leave someone you love or hate out? Let me know on social media. Reporting for Razorback Reels, I'm Maddie Phipps. Thanks, Maddie, for that recap of the heroes and villains of the entertainment world this week. Now, Ani, out of all those winners and losers, was there one you agreed with, one you disagreed with? Um, I can honestly say Maddie was spot on. on like, I have seen that TikTok sound of JoJo Siwa on the red carpet being like, no one's ever done this before. No one has ever made such a switch up. I'm the first one in our generation to do this while there's simultaneously like posting pictures of like dozens of other artists that have done exactly the same thing also in our generation. <laughs> uh, one of the winners Maddie chose as well, Chapel Rowan. So glad mm -hmm. she's getting her debut at Coachella, getting to go with, with perform people like No Doubt and exactly. Tyler the Creator. Such an mm -hmm. awesome start. Yeah, this past weekend marked the beginning of one of the most highly anticipated events of the year. Catch us back here after the break to recap all things fashion and festival. We hope you're still tuned in because our next segment, Hogwild Harmonies, covers all things music. This week, we're jumping into one of the country's most well-known music festivals. Reels reporter Gigi Kramer is here to give you the rundown on everything that you might have missed during the first weekend of Coachella. Coachella just wrapped up its first weekend on a high note after a lot of early criticism from fans. Many were dismayed by the lineup, but the weekend was full of great moments, especially for some rising stars. In what some have dubbed Chapel Cella, Chapel Roan took the stage in the Gobi tent. Roan has recently been gaining popularity after opening for Olivia Rodrigo's Guts tour. Chapel definitely takes home my award for best visuals as the background for her song Good Luck Babe is straight out of a PowerPoint presentation I would have made at eight years old. As unserious as the vibes were, she was able to showcase her serious talent and hopefully made her way into some new fans' hearts. 2024 is shaping up to be the year of Sabrina Carpenter and I'm so here for it. Coming off opening for the Eras tour and a brand new release, expectations for her Coachella set were sky high and she most certainly exceeded them. Everything about Sabrina's set perfectly embodied her aesthetic and personality. From the physical set itself to the song choices and the new arrangements she performed, it all just screamed Sabrina Carpenter in the best way possible. While she is a big enough name to pull in fans, she's not a headliner, so you can only assume it'll be a lot of people's first time hearing her. She and her team struck just the right balance of good introductory songs for new listeners and fan favorites to appease those who do know her in the audience. As a bonus, I'm always a sucker for live instrumentations, and I loved the piano solo before emails I can't send and the jazzy new version of Because I Liked a Boy. All of that without even mentioning that she performed her brand new song Espresso Live for the first time, Sabrina truly just killed it. Now, before I cover the headliners, here's some rapid fire highlights that I can't miss. 
Gwen Stefani and her band No Doubt brought Olivia Rodrigo on to sing their song Bathwater. Renee Rapp of Mean Girls fame brought Kesha on stage to perform TikTok, one of Kesha's most popular songs. And Shakira was brought out as a surprise guest during Bizarre set where she announced a world tour. Paris Hilton also made an appearance with Vampire Weekends during their set to play cornhole with them on stage. And finally, Will Smith made a cameo in full men in black attire during J Balvin set. Whew. Okay, now on to the headliners. Lana Del Rey rolled up to her set on a motorcycle Friday night while an excerpt of one of her unreleased songs, Jealous Girls, played. Many people, including myself, were shocked that she was chosen as a headliner due to her more quiet and laid back vibe, but despite some mic issues, Lana performed very well. She brought out Billie Eilish to perform Ocean Eyes and video games, and allegedly Jeff Bezos was seen in the VIP tent waiting for her performance in one of the most shockingly hilarious things I have heard all year. A New Night brings a new headliner, and on Saturday it was Tyler, the creator. His set contains two collaborations with artists that he, in his own words, used to hate. Childish Gambino came out to perform Running Out of Time with Tyler, while ASAP Rocky performed Potato Salad and Who Dat Boy. To end his set, Tyler flew above the crowd just minutes before the festival's 1 a.m. curfew. Overall, his performance encapsulated his personality very well. And last but not least, and never to be outdone, Doja Cat also brought out a weird and risque performance to the Coachella stage on Sunday night. She didn't perform her greatest hits, which upset some fans, but if there's one thing we know about Doja Cat, it's that she's going to do what she wants to do. Like many other artists, Doja brought some special guests on stage with her. My favorite collab would have to be the T-Rex that she brought out during her set. I'm kidding. I loved her collab collaboration with The Joy, a South African a cappella group. Her other guests included Tizo Touchdown and ASAP Rocky, two artists that she collabed with on the deluxe edition of Scarlet, her most recent album. She ended the night and the first weekend of Coachella crawling in the mud during her final song, which I cannot say the name of on air. <laughs> what a way to go out. Unfortunately, that's all the time I have today, but if you're interested in anything I talked about, be sure to check out the Weekend's two live streams. For Razorback Reels, I'm Gigi Kramer, sending it back to you, anchors. Thanks, Gigi, for that festive report. Now that we're all caught up on all the happenings of Coachella, let's take a closer look at some of the star-studded fashion we're seeing this festival season. Our Hog Culture segment focuses on all the latest celebrity trends, looks, and designers. We have Gracie Tui in studio to walk us through some of the latest concert fits from this weekend. Coachella kicked off festival season this past weekend, and I'm here to report on all the fashion we witnessed. The first weekend of Coachella sets a tone for the summer months and the festivals that follow. As excited as concertgoers are to see their favorite artists, outfit planning is just as anticipated when it comes to Coachella. Let's dive into this weekend's fashion and what else we can expect to see this festival season. Coachella outfits come in many different varieties. However, one celebrity has always set the vibe for Coachella fashion trends. Vanessa Hudgens is often referred to as the Queen of Coachella, but she cannot attend this year. I wanted to highlight one of her outfits from last year as it is still very trendy. She styled the bathing suit perfectly by elevating it with a mesh dress, and the style of the dress is perfect for the weather and location of Coachella. The added accessories and jewelry complete the final look. Festival outfit pieces that seem to be trending include cowboy boots, lace, crochet, mesh, lots of jewelry, denim, and even leather. Cowboy boots with festival outfits have been a trend in recent years, but right now they are more popular than ever. Paris Hilton's Western-inspired outfit matched the vibe perfectly, pairing the cowboy boots with the flowy dress and lots of accessories. I think this was a super trendy outfit that I loved. Coastal Cowgirl is definitely in for this festival season. Continuing with the Western-inspired outfits, I love this vest paired with the boots and the accessories like this outfit on the right. The metallic pants with rhinestone boots on the left pair well together, and I'm obsessed with both outfits. This year's outfits seem to be more casual than usual, turning towards graphic tees and shorts with boots and accessories. I've always been a fan of layered, over-the-top outfits, but I think these simple outfits are also super cute. Coachella is a perfect time to have fun with your outfit and wear something you might not be able to wear any other time, while also staying true to your style. As long as you're comfortable and having fun, that is all that matters. Thanks for following along the fashion rundown of the first weekend of Coachella. For Razorback Reels, I'm Gracie Tui. Thanks, Gracie, for giving us plenty of OOTD inspiration with your coverage. Now, Ani, starting out, what was 
one of your favorite parts about Coachella from this weekend, whether it be the performances, the outfits, what mm -hmm. stood out to you? My favorite was probably, like Gigi mentioned, probably a lot of Sabrina Carpenter. I just, mm. she's just such a great performer and is such a hoot to watch every single time, every performance, she brings something new to the table, especially with her nonsense outro changing every time she performs. But she has just such an incredible stage presence that you don't really see that often with artists this new, this green. Um, but I think she's definitely earning her keep. I, I, I agree with you. You know, Coachella has been so great for me this weekend just because, not that I went, but just to <laughs> see, just because there was the revival of all these artists I love who mm -hmm. aren't making music at the moment, but came to perform, like No Doubt, mm -hmm. Childish Gambino. It was so awesome to see both of them. Uh, it's like a blast from Coachella. the past. I know, it's great. It's a, this big reunion that I didn't know I needed. Mm -hmm. um, but on top of that, I have to say that Coachella overall, is there anyone that you wish would have been on the lineup this year that you think was snubbed? I wish, I mean, you know, Hairstyles was at Coachella last year, um, and that was my entire personality for, like, the two months he was on Coachella Taste. It wasn't two months, but... It was my entire personality for that entire time. And I, you know, with Coachella season, I just miss him and Shania Twain. I really do. I miss that video of them dancing together on stage. But, you know, it's fine. I'll, it'll suffice. With enough fan support, you can get him back to the main stage to be headlining. You just you can't give up. And that will be my promise to you, viewers. Mm -hmm. I will get Harry Styles back on the Coachella stage. What about uh, you, Drew? In terms of? The performers, do you think someone got oh, snubbed? Oh, gosh. Um, so many great, I feel like there's so many great smaller performers who I wish I, should have gotten the opportunity to, I think, perform. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are up and coming and I think maybe deserve some of that. Uh, great smaller R&B artists, mm -hmm. uh, Montel Fish, uh, Sampha. I feel like there's a lot of great artists who fit the vibe of Coachella that definitely should have gotten the opportunity. But then again, it happens once a year, so yeah. it's not like they're missing out or the opportunity's over. Gotcha. What about the outfits, do you think? They were great. <laughs> no complaints here from Drew. <laughs> if you're looking for a new show to dive into, you're in luck. After the break, our in-studio reporters will give you their TV recommendations as professional binge watchers, so stay tuned. Whether it's a sitcom, limited series, or animated program, watching a great TV show is a perfect pastime. In studio reporter Francesca Brown Haney is here to help us navigate through the wild world of cable and streaming. Looking for your next TV binge? I've got you covered with a list of shows that are so good they should be on everyone's bucket list. These flicks have it all. Compelling storylines, unforgettable characters, and enough twists and turns to keep you on the edge of your seat. Whether you're a fan of drama, comedy, or something in between, there's a show on this list that's sure to become your new favorite. So what are you waiting for? Start watching now and thank me later. Now, I say this after every show I watch, but How to Get Away with Murder was the best thing I have done for myself in a while, and I would kick myself if I didn't include it on this list. This appropriately named show can be watched on Netflix, but I must warn you, this is not a show for the casual watcher. If you take your eyes off Viola Davis and her Keating Five for even a minute, you risk missing everything. How to Get Away with Murder is a testament to unplugging and paying attention, and you'll want to put your phone away to watch Annalise Keating kick it in a courtroom. And Viola Davis' performance is by definition breathtaking. I mean, she became Annalise, a woman who is extremely hungry for power, hypocritical, and a bully. But she is also a complex, independent woman you can't stop rooting for, no matter what she does or who she protects. Now, that's all I can say without giving too much away. 10 out of 10. Next up on my list is a certified binge-worthy network television show you might remember. Meet Earl, a small-time thief who loses his winning $100,000 lottery ticket after being hit by a car while he celebrates his good fortune. As any sane man would do, he blames it on karma and strikes a deal with her. He creates a list of all of his wrongdoings in life and dedicates that he will make it up to karma by making it up to the people on his list. I promise you'll have a great time watching this show if you enjoyed The Middle, Raising Hope, Rules of Engagement, Two and a Half Men, or 
any of that era cable television. It's simple, hilarious, with a good heart, and you won't regret it. My name is Earl, can be found on Hulu. If you were like me and have already watched the classics, Teen Wolf, Gossip Girl, Vampire Diaries, and Pretty Little Liars, you must start Desperate Housewives. It's a wickedly enjoyable blend of suburbia's secrets and scandal where every perfectly manicured lawn hides a multitude of sins. It's a bit soapy, sure, but what great drama isn't? Wisteria Lane and the women who rule it are bingeable and rewatchable. It's a really good show, clever, entertaining, unexpected twists, and it has a satisfying, well thought out ending. I think it's been underappreciated by our generation. There's a lot of comedy, but the drama is better, and sometimes it's really dark. It has season arcs, mysteries, but also lots of secrets through multiple seasons. It's lots of great action scenes too. Desperate Housewives can be also found on Hulu. But let me introduce you to Bones. Dr. Temperance Brennan works as a forensics anthropologist at the Jeffersonian Institute in DC. Through happenstance, she works with special agent Celie Booth to help the FBI solve crimes while identifying human remains that are too far gone for the standard FBI forensics team. If you love a good power duo, you'll love this. Brennan and Booth work with undeniable chemistry and their ability to solve the most puzzling of crimes with a blend of science, wit, and heart is certifiably bingeable. Now, if you excuse me, I have some things to watch, and you hopefully do too. I'm Francesca Brown Haney, reporting for Razorback Reels. Thanks, Francesca, for giving us all kinds of awesome shows to catch up on. Which of these have you already seen or do you want to see because of Francesca's review? Now, let me tell you. How to Get Away with Murder has always been on my list. Mm -hmm. I love Viola Davis. She's an EGOT winner, so I've always admired her, and it's been on my list, but there's a ton of shows that I have on my plate right now. Mm -hmm. I'm currently in the midst of finishing The Bear, which they have yes, season three course. coming out soon, so I gotta mm -hmm. finish that. And then after that, I'm wanting to start Ripley, which is the new um, TV miniseries on Netflix starring Andrew Scott as Tom okay. Ripley. It's, I've, it's got an amazing reviews, and I've I only heard, heard of that one. only heard great things so far. It's got uh, Andrew Scott, Dakota Fanning, and it's directed Love by her. this director I really like, and so I'm super mm -hmm. excited to start that. After that, I don't know. I've been told by a million people to watch <laughs> a couple different shows, but you know, you ever have to politely kind of give the hint to someone that you don't want to watch the show they're watching. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's good. That's um, how about we watch this, though, actually? <laughs> um, no, I totally agree with you with How to Get Away with Murder. I actually started it not too long ago um, because imagine my surprise whenever I switched my major to criminology and it was nothing like this show. I don't even, I don't even know how to hide a dead body. And I'm a junior. So what's that about? What's the, mm, that's frustrating, really. <laughs> I you know. Think, you'd think they'd teach you that. They exactly. Don't. I was really disappointed. But, you know, Desperate Housewives, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll, I love Desperate Housewives. I love Real Housewives. Anything with Housewives, anything with, like, um, Trophy Wife, anything like that, any kind of, like, reality TV series, that's my gig. Um, I'll say it again. I've been watching Vanderpump Rules and also Vander, uh, Vanderpump Villa, that's on Hulu that's premiering right now. Oh my gosh, I am so excited because I'm almost done with Brand Pump Rules. Um, and I'm also super excited to watch, oh, I think it's The Valley with one of the stars mm. from Brand Pump Rules. But I know you don't like um, reality TV. So ah. what's one of the dramas that you're looking in? Um, can't think of a drama off the top of my head, but I can't, I can't go without uh, acknowledging what Francesca brought up a second ago with My Name is Earl and yes. how much I adore that show <laughs> and Jason Lee. Mm -hmm. I think it is so witty and clever and that it's not something that not enough people mm -hmm. talk about. And so if there is any Reels recommendation you're getting from me tonight, it's definitely to watch My Name is Earl. But yeah. in terms of drama shows that I'm wanting to watch or are coming up, um, Three Body Problem is a show on Netflix okay. that has been getting a lot of buzz recently that I'm also planning on starting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in the midst of about to start a lot of shows, but not currently watching any shows. So I'll have to work on that. Well, summer's coming up. Hopefully you'll have a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. Also graduation for you. Yep. But, right, so um, sad. you know, uh, we there's so many good shows. And thanks so much to Francesca for giving us a little scoop. Absolutely. That's a wrap on this episode of Razorback Reels. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Razorback underscore Reels. I'm Drew Chamberlain. And I'm Oni Olivas. Have a wonderful night.